Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I am Louise Palenker. These days, with streaming television, video on demand, cable and broadcast, you actually have too many choices. What you need is a curator. That's where Media Path Podcast comes in. We'll give you viewing and reading and listening ideas, and hopefully one or two will stick. But what we're mostly excited about is the chance to introduce you to interesting and accomplished guests that have achieved great things in many fields, like today's guest. We're going to have a discussion with Reverend Dr. Susan Johnson Cook. This amazing lady has achieved firsts in so many venues, particularly in the theological area. I'll introduce you to her in just a couple of minutes. But Wheezy, what do you have for us this week? All right, Fritzy, I've been watching some uh, some of the TV. Do you have that where you live? Okay. So there's a little movie called Little Men on Hulu. You'll find it starring Greg Kinnear as a struggling New York actor. Not to be confused with Little Men by Louisa May Alcott, which is a book she wrote after she wrote Little Women. Now, generally speaking, I am not a big fan of name repetition. If your last name is Armstrong. Don't name your kid Neil. That's not cute. Mm -hmm. He will probably never make it to the moon. Let him carve out his own identity. Mm -hmm. If your name is Frank Sinatra, don't name your kid Frank Sinatra Jr. Mm -hmm. I digress. In the case of this film, the title could have a few meanings. The boys in the film are young, but they show the maturity of men. The man in the film often makes choices that seem little. Greg Kinnear and his family inherit his father's home, move in, and proceed to go about evicting the woman in the shop downstairs while their son is becoming best buds with the shop owner's son. It's sort of a buddy, coming-of-age gentrification flick, very sweet, and it makes you think Little Men on Hulu. Wow, good suggestion. Well, both of my suggestions this week are on Showtime. Showtime does great documentaries, and these are two. The first one is Attica. Those of us of a certain age remember the prison uprising in 1971 at Attica Correctional Facility in upstate New York. This was a five-day standoff between black and Latino inmates at the prison and law enforcement. The inmates took over including taking hostages to protest prison conditions, including things like minuscule food portions, inadequate medical facilities, no educational training, unfair disciplinary hearings. Inmates took guards hostages. They set up tents. They dug latrines in the yard. And you have to put this riot into context. This was during the Nixon administration. Nixon's main platform was law and order. Plus, you had the governor of New York that was Nelson Rockefeller, who didn't want to appear weak in Nixon's eyes, so he didn't give in to any of the inmates' demands. Police ended up firing at the prisoners and the hostages. Twenty prisoners and ten hostages were killed. After police reestablished control, they harassed prisoners, they beat them, they tortured them. So, why watch this 50-year-old incident? Because racism and unequal treatment in correctional facilities still goes on today full bore. This movie fuels the whole discussion about the privatization of prisons and the over-incarceration of African-American men and other minorities. In other words, 50 years after this incident, the beat goes on. It's dark, but it's very, very interesting. And there's interviews with people who were prisoners during that standoff and people that were taken hostage and the kids of officers that were taken hostage that live in Attica, New York. And it's not that far away from Buffalo where, where I grew no, up. So I was no, very that was the whole you know, connection for me was it was very close to where a lot of my radio career was. And d- immediately after the incident, did anything change? Was anything learned? What was the public perception after this riot? Not noticeable change because the point of me suggesting that people listen to it and watch it was that nothing has changed. The racism that's endemic in the prison and between the guards and the authorities and the prisoners has not changed. And you add to that what wasn't going on at the time, which is the privatization of the criminal justice system. And, and you realize that we have a long way to go. Yeah. So it's a good time for everybody to gain some better perspective and and learn from our history. That's just, it's so critical. Um, I watched a movie on Netflix called The Unforgivable. 
Have you seen this one? I haven't seen it. This is a gut-wrenchingly moving saga which shines a light on the post-incarceration prison of judgment and shame that haunts those who serve time for a crime. In this case, Sandra Bullock's character, Ruth Slater, has spent 20 years in prison for the murder of a police officer as she fought to protect her home and her little sister. Now on the other side of her sentence, with no friends, no job, and no visible mercy, she is searching for that little sister. That sister has been adopted into a loving home where her father is Richard Thomas. Leave her alone, Sandra Bullock. She's safe with John Boy. But (laughs) you know our Sandy. She's fierce. She's scrappy. And this story unfolds like a lit fuse as the sons of the man she killed begin hunting Ruth Slater, who was stalking her old home, which is now owned by a couple played by Viola Davis and Vincent D'Onofrio, in the process of hunting her sister, whose parents do not want her to be found. It's a lot but it unfolds compellingly. The film explores how trauma inspires more trauma and asks us to question when forgiveness should be embraced as the pathway to healing. The Unforgivable is now streaming on Netflix. I wanted to watch it because when you go to it and it's been newly added, it's the first thing that pops up. I've just gone past it, but now I'll give it a view. My next documentary on Showtime is The Real Charlie Chaplin. Now, Charlie Chaplin is still considered by many people as the greatest comedian of all time. He shot to fame in Hollywood from the slums of Victorian England during the first years of the 20th century. At one point, he was the most famous and beloved person in the world. That was followed by one of the most spectacular of history's falls from grace. This documentary is made up mostly of videos seen for the first time, along with Chaplin home videos and revealing interviews with Charlie Chaplin, who did very few interviews in his lifetime. It takes a broad look at his film accomplishments, his comedic genius, his relentless quest for perfection with visual gags, and the humanity in his performances, which is truly what endeared him to the world. But the bulk of the film looks at the parts of his private life that are not widely known. Chaplin had a penchant for extremely young women. He courted them. He married them. He was also perceived as a communist sympathizer. So the combination of being a sexual predator and a communist was enough to dampen the public's love for him. So he eventually took his family to Switzerland. He had one moment which was sort of semi-triumphant as he came back to the States and received an honorary Oscar and everybody made a fuss for one night. This film, is just another example of the imperfection of our heroes and the three-dimensional aspect of genius. My sons became huge Charlie Chaplin fans watching Robert Downey Jr. in one of his greatest acting roles as Chaplin back in the 90s, and that was such a, a wonderful film. And so our whole family has always sort of followed him. But there is a real darkness to this man. He sounds like a QAnon fever dream. <laughs> he really does. With the communism and the pedophilia. Just a couple of little snafus in the personality uh, complex. Um, so are you ready to introduce our guest? I, I, I am, and I, I'm so anxious to talk to this lady because I just know our lives will be better once we have a conversation with her. Mm-hmm. She's accomplished so many firsts in her life. She went to Emerson and Columbia, and she went to Union and United Theological Seminary where she got her Doctor of Theology. She's the first African-American woman to be named pastor of Mariner's Temple Baptist Church in Lower Manhattan. She's the first African-American and first woman woman to hold the position of U.S. Ambassador for International Religious Freedom. She advised Presidents Clinton and Obama on domestic policy. She is the first female chaplain of the New York Police Department, which she did for 21 years. In the year 2000, the New York Times named her one of New York's top five pastors. She's a civil, gender, and human rights activist, and I find one of her most fascinating Lines in her long resume was, she officiated at the funeral of her mentor and godmother, Coretta Scott King, which is mind-blowing. I can't wait to talk to her about that. She's written 13 books. Reverend Dr. Susan Johnson Cook, we are so honored to speak to you, ma'am. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. And Merry Christmas to you. I know it's a busy time of year in your business. Oh, yeah. (laughs) This is one of our seasons. You were steeped in faith as a young girl and on Sundays I mean your life was devoted to the church first you went to your mom's Presbyterian service then you walked down the street and you went to your dad's Baptist service talk about the importance of faith in your childhood you know what's so amazing today I did a zoom 
with um, some of the women who walked with my mother in the Presbyterian Church. My mother's deceased, but there's a 102-year-old woman named Dr. Thelma there, and she is Zooming <laughs> with people in the Presbyterian Church. So it was just such an honor and certainly tear jerking to remember the women who walked beside my mother. It was, you know, it was the emerging black middle class and many of my parents and their friends, you know, emerged from the uh, South where they were sharecroppers in this generation to the North in hopes of really having something better. And I saw what partnerships could do. I saw what faith could do. And so in the midst of our church services, it was really our village being created. And so we were given our marching orders, but we also were given the encouragement. So I would have my Dr. Seuss books open and they were like, so where are you going to college? And I'm like, I just been see Dick run, you know? <laughs> and they were like, but where are you going to college? And so failure was not an option. They were pouring and depositing in us that this next generation couldn't go back to the fields. And so you had to have the tools and the resources and, the, and take advantage of the opportunities that our parents fought for, worked for. And so it was a loving environment. So really I had two church homes. It wasn't just like, you know, my parents took me to church all day. My mother's church being Presbyterian was over by 12 noon, you know, 11 to 12, one hour. And the Baptist <laughs> church was just getting started 10 blocks away. And so I just had these wonderful people who said, we're counting on you. We're rooting for you. We're cheering you on. And to this day, those who are still alive, I'm now cheering for them. And I'm now making sure that they're okay in their senior years, that they truly may be golden years. And you're a person who really celebrates intergenerational relationships. You strongly believe in mentorships and you strongly believe in, you know, passing in both directions, wisdom, experience, fellowship. So talk about you, your mentor and then talk about I watched in one of your podcasts where you had everybody talk about their mentee, and I thought that was just so lovely. So talk about that for us. Well, again, my mother, our home was one that people gravitated towards. So she was the matriarch of our family, but she was also the matriarch of our community. And being from New York, you know, we live in the most diverse city. But I lived in this apartment high rise called the Executive Towers overlooking Yankee Stadium. And it really represented the diversity of New York. So there were 24 floors, 17 apartments on each floor. On our floor, there were 11 different ethnicities. And so we didn't grow up saying you're different. We were like, these are my playmates. These are their families. And this is how we live together. We grow together. We play basketball together. And I think that that is such a healthy beginning. And so they would come to my mother's house on Sunday after church. She was a great Southern cook. And they would stay for hours talking, playing games. Um, people like Chuck Schumer, who was an assemblyman with my brother, you know, were in our living room. Dave Dinkins, who becomes the first black mayor, was in our living room as city clerk. And so my parents would say, go talk to them. You know, like, you're not going to be a wallflower and have all these people in our house. And so it was a very comfortable feeling in terms of developing personality and outgoingness. I am an extrovert all the way through. And if people ask me, like, what's your number one trait? It's personality. And I got that in that environment. And so for that, when I became an ambassador with 199 countries in my portfolio, I had already visited 60 of those countries. I had been around people from those countries. So, you know, it was just about learning the protocol as a diplomat, but it wasn't about being um, new to culture. It was really about just how do you formalize this ambassadorship and how do you follow the rules in this new walk of life? So I really had a great upbringing. Kids would come. So we had a curfew, but everybody wanted to spend the night at my house. <laughs> so we would come in late. And we would stay up all night. So we honored the curfew by being in the house, but <laughs> we were in the house up late, which, you know, again, was uh, amazing. Uh, you, you mentioned several times in some of your teachings that uh, children start out by adopting the faith structure of their parents. But you uh, said that your father's faith tended to resonate with you because you had what you called a praying father. Talk about the importance of that in the development of your calling. 
You did your research. Well, my father was on his knees every single night. In fact, in my bedroom now is the bench that he would kneel down and pray on. And so I now kneel down and pray on it. But his faith was amazing. And my father never took a drink in his life, although there was alcohol around us, of course. But he just felt like he was this man of faith. He was an usher, not a minister. He was an usher. So he stood as they say, as a doorkeeper in God's house for 40 years. And I really believe that his faithfulness really blazed the trail for me to become a minister because the Baptist world and really the church world was not really ready for a woman in ministry, but it wasn't that this was just a woman. This was Wilbert's daughter. And so the people who wanted to perhaps oppose it, who were my father's age, we're like, but that's Wilbert's daughter. So yes, we vote yes. And so it was amazing. It was unanimous. And then all of a sudden, they don't even realize they're making history by having the first Black woman in the Baptist world to become a pastor. And then, of course, they were my cheerleaders. Yeah, I knew she was going to mm-hmm. be great. Uh-huh. And so I This is at home. Mariner's Temple. I just don't want to get too far. Is this at Mariner's Temple where the congregation no, had the vote? Baptist oh, Church, okay. which is my home church from where I was. My ministry was birthed. And where I continue to go to this day. Mm -hmm. Wow. So Mariner's Temple was the first church that they say I'm called to as a senior pastor. Mm -hmm. And and the Baptist world, they have to vote you in. They have to interview you. They have to hear you preach. They have to spend a little time with you. And then what they say is they extend a call, which means they vote to say this will be our pastor. So Mariner's Temple was the first church that I was voted and became the first black woman in the American Baptist Church history. Even they were not really clear or sure that they were making history. They were just like, this church is dying. We just heard this young woman preach. Let's give her a shot. And it turned out to be one of the best shots ever I was given and they that they received. And we grew together and it was amazing. And what were some of the changes that you implemented that you think maybe may not have happened without a woman's perspective and point of view? Well, thank you for that question. So first of all, you know, we are very nurturing by nature. And so senior citizens being in my church, there was, you know, not I, I didn't pour into what you cannot do. I wouldn't let them say, you know, I got arthritis. I got I was like, so what can you do? And so I took them. I, my late brother was a politician, as I shared. And so we did subway stops. This is pre social media. So we couldn't just put a little flyer out and then send it around on Facebook or whatever. We had to physically meet people. So I think going on those subway stops, going door to door, knocking on people's doors and saying, I'm your new pastor, you know, give me a shot, you know, kind of just talking the lingo um, that they were used to, but at the same time saying, you know, give me a shot. And I think the third thing was creating this lunchtime service um, and taking the risk because in New York at the, at the, um, end of Manhattan, it it becomes a V. Mm -hmm. And that's where Wall Street is. That's where the police headquarters is. That's where City Hall is. And my church was right in the middle of that triangle. So I said, let's have this lunchtime service. And we ended up having sometimes a thousand people at lunchtime come to that service. And that's really what put us on the map, being daring as a woman, being a risk taker, and then walking side by side with families who were having issues and saying, let me take your hand and walk with you. You're not going into court alone. You're not going to the funeral home alone. And I think that personal touch is definitely a woman's touch. You know, you talked about something earlier that I think is so fascinating. It might be missing from today's uh, church going environment. And that is that you said at church, particularly for the African-American community. You have to remember, this was an urban environment. So you had Mm -hmm. people who were stressed economically, but the church provided a template and and sort of insisted that you live up to your potential and gave you the structure of how to do that, which was so important. Uh, They wanted you to achieve. They they asked you where you're going to go to college. What are you doing to better yourself? What are you reading? And I think Wow. And uh, particularly in an environment where that might have been missing from homes. So the church was providing the parenting on a larger basis, um, you know, with their sermons and whatnot. I just think that's so fascinating. And I don't know that that's the case these days. Yeah, definitely. It was when I said village, it was a series of families 
uh, collectively raising children. Uh, you know, Hillary Clinton used the line, it takes a village, but that came from an African proverb um, that it really does take a village. So there were families, and in those days, there really were not a lot of broken families, not a lot of single mother households in the environment I was in. People walk together, they work together, they partner together as husbands and wives. And then in the community at the church, they were like, that's our child, that's our baby. And, you know, so you could go to church and you would feel like the peacock, like the NBC peacock, <laughs> because as you walked in, everyone was affirming you, everyone was cheering you on. And so it was a collective. And so the community that I chose to live in and raise my sons in was a community very much like that. It's called Sag Harbor, New York. It's a beach town, but it's a historically African-American community. And it gave me what I felt I had in the church world and what I had in those summers where I would go down south. We used to call it down south and visit my maternal relatives. Again, the collective, again, the really positive. So if I would walk in my grandmother's home in the south, she was like, so speak some Spanish for me. She didn't understand <laughs> it, but it was the fact that I was bilingual at 14. Okay, and take out that certificate you just got and <laughs> show it around. And so what began to happen was the village, the community was aiming high. And so many times I was kind of the trophy, but it was like a good thing. Like, okay, we can aspire to do better than this. And again, failure was not an option. What's the best you can do? So. Okay, you got a B, all right, we'll accept that today, but how do you get a B plus? And then how do you get an A minus? And then how do you get an A? And it wasn't the kind of stress pressure, but it was, did you do the best you could and where was it that you could have done better? And so homework was important, having a time to sit down to dinner together. Those are things that don't happen as much or often as much. And so all of that was around the table. You know, my mother was a school teacher. So around the table was a spelling bee, you know, spell <laughs> Chizo, Chico, you know, spell whatever. And you're like, I just want to eat my pork chop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all of that again were, were lessons. And if you couldn't spell, it's like, why can't you? Um, why, what, didn't, what did you miss? Um, and so those were the kind of environments I loved and to this day raised my children in those kinds of environments. So it always felt like a challenge that you could aspire to or achieve and not something intimidating where you felt like a failure where you're not measuring up. Exactly. And, you know, we had we had the options to choose the lane, you know, like, you know, these were all new things to our parents, just like the parents today who are homeschooling, who never thought they'd have to learn new math and all these things. In those days, you know, my parents didn't know a lot of the things that we were learning, but they knew that if we applied ourselves and we did our homework and we went to school and, you know, so there were no sick days. I think I used to get the award <laughs> every year, the little gold star for no absences because it's like you're coughing. That's all right. Take some medicine and you're going to school. <laughs> and so, uh, and now I realize that they really didn't have a babysitter. Like if my mother was teaching all day and my father was working all day, who was going to care for me? So it was sort of like, not only did you get world well, but you're going to school because we don't have any backup plan. And you just kind of learn like, okay, so I'm going to be not only brilliant, but I'm going to learn how to be resilient. Well, when did you realize you had the calling to the ministry? How old were you? Um, age 13. Um, in those same summers in the South, uh, there was a school called Barbara Scotia College, a Presbyterian HBCU. And there was a young woman named Katie Cannon, who was a student there. And she was a Presbyterian pastor um, early. She was like 18, of course, and she would come to our home. Um, as you know, you always have a college home where you can eat certain foods and put your feet <laughs> up. And we were that home for her. And I knew when I, 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 when I saw her, something leaped in me, like the Christmas spirit, like something leaped in me that said, that's what you're going to do. But you know, I was 13. So you do the normal teenage stuff, jump double dutch, go on trips. But I knew um, there was a church in Boston. I went to Emerson College, as you said in your introduction, and there was a, a church in Cambridge, Mass, near Harvard called St. Paul AME Church, which stands for African Methodist Episcopal. And there was this dynamic young teen, John Bryan and Cecilia Bryan, and in the pews with us were these college students from MIT and Harvard and others who did not deny their brilliance, 
who affirmed our cultural heritage and who also were Christian. And so the late Ron McNair, who died on the Space Challenger, um, mm -hmm. all of the, so we could bring our gifts and our talents. He taught us karate. I was in theater at Emerson, so I could do the plays. And at the same time, we had this faith thing. It was in that experience that I knew that the church was more than just a place that I felt good, but that it was a place that I was going to serve. And so the summer after college, when I graduated, I went to West Africa and it was in those fields where we didn't have cell phones, of course, we didn't have ways to get back to our family, but it was just the sun by day and the moon by night that I was like, I feel called to the ministry and wrote my pastor. We used to have these uh, grams, some, I think we called them aerograms that you would fold over and you would send back your mail. And I said, I really think I feel called to preach. And about 60 of us who were in a choir together in that same church became leading pastors all around the nation. So there was something amazing going wow. on and we became friends certainly in ministry, but it was that experience that I think was life changing for me. Wow. Uh, you get and give a lot of community and joy through the church, but oftentimes in the world we see religion used used to divide people. Can you speak to those dichotomies and why that is and what we can do to heal it? Well, you know, being ambassador for international religious freedom is ambassador at large, which means I had the whole globe, all 199 countries. And I had to sit with the religious right. In fact, this position had been written into government, even though it was signed under President Clinton when Madeleine Albright was secretary, it really had been written into government so that a conservative could have this position. And we ended up serving at the pleasure of the president. So I served under President Obama. But my point is that it, it was a U.S. Senate confirmation position. And I had to sit with the right, the religious right. And guess what? They had to sit with me. So it wasn't one-sided. And some miraculous things happened in those four years that we worked together. By the end, they were like, you know what? You're not so bad after all. And I'm like, and you're not so bad. And this was... Um, that all of us had to take a risk because we had a common goal. We had a common denominator. And so we worked together because we wanted some things to happen in the world. And we saw some things accomplished. There was this moment in my Senate confirmation hearings uh, where they said, well, the family of Susan Johnson Cook stand. And it's supposed to be your immediate family. Well, all these conservative men stood up and the optic of that was, we stand with her. Oh, and I wow. think we had more of those moments where we say, we stand together. You know, we don't agree on everything. We weren't raised the same way. But yeah, that's my family. And I think that moment was life changing for me as well. You need to get back to Washington and fix stuff. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I can no, yeah, I know. <laughs> because I look at it now, and, and maybe you'll comment on this, uh, and I don't want to get too political and make you uncomfortable, but it just seems like the chasm uh, between us is so deep. I don't know if it's uh, reparable, even with religion. You, you look at how the evangelical movement seems to have commandeered their religion and their right-wing politics to be more godlike and more Christ-like, and I find that offensive. I find it offensive as well. And I think when you have leadership, whether it's the leader of this nation, but when you have leadership that suggests it's all right to be divisive, that's a real problem. So I don't know if it's irreparable, but I know that it's gonna take a long time to be repaired. I, I was watching recently and I see people who were strong members of Congress that I knew and depended on uh, in the Congressional Black Caucus and otherwise who are leaving. They can't take it anymore. And after the insurrection last January, which we're coming up on that anniversary, they were like, our lives were threatened. Mm -hmm. You know, they were gonna kill whomever they found. And when it gets that bad, um, we really don't have a democracy any longer. I don't know what we have, but it's not good. So I don't know if I'm the one to get back to Washington um, because this is not a Band-Aid moment. Mm -hmm. This is like an ace bandage moment. Well <laughs> said, well said. USA. Yeah, yeah, we need an operating theater stat. <laughs> yeah. So now you, you advised President Clinton. Can you remember a piece of advice that you gave him? 
Um, yeah, I mean, certainly there's clergy president privileges, but I think the biggest piece of advice um, was when President Nelson Mandela came. Um, and for me, that was a moment because, mm -hmm. you know, President Mandela had been in prison for 27 years and then President Clinton and he are walking side by side on the White House lawn. For me, that was a major moment. But just in terms of advice, in terms of what was culturally important to South Africans, what was important to us as African Americans, those were moments that we shared together. You know, your official title when you were doing that job was Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. And I don't know what your job was, but it doesn't sound easy because you had to butt heads with large governments like China that disapproved of organized religion. How did you navigate those waters? I don't think we always did. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, um, the first of all, as a diplomat, you only go where you're invited and where the U.S. Embassy has kind of paved the way for you. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I preceded the president and the secretary of state. Sometimes I went with them and sometimes I followed them. And so there's a climate as well as a culture. And we always had to figure out the climate of that particular country. So there was an opportunity for me to go initially and China said no. And then there was another opportunity that they said yes. And I think you have to, as a diplomat, first of all, depend on your State Department staff and personnel. They're not going to send you where it's not right. Mm -hmm. They're not going to send you into death. But where I had to go were religious war zones, you know, places where religion was just not tolerated and people were persecuted. And again, you had to walk very lightly because had you said the wrong thing, had you made the wrong move, there were people who would have been killed. Um, we had to take families out of a certain country, but we it was not a headlines kind of job. People hear ambassador and they think you're going to an island and you're going to be on the beach and have big parties and host <laughs> parties. This was not that kind of thing. Um, this was where there weren't headlines because had we made the headlines um, many times, those families would have been killed. And so the Yazidis and, and it was the beginning of of really terrorism starting. Um, we didn't know how divisive it was going to be or how explosive it was going to be. Uh, places like Nigeria and, and Boko Haram, uh, we didn't realize then that it would become what it is now, but still we had to tread those waters. So every time we went abroad, we were briefed, we were prepared. Um, sometimes we had to wear body armor. And that's when I was like, body armor? I didn't sign up for war. And they were like, oh, yes, you did. So, you know, really kind of changing the mindset that um, this isn't sweet and fluffy, but this is really being in the woods. But I will tell you my highlight, mm -hmm. um, because as a Baptist woman pastor, I tell you how hard it was to be a, a woman pastor in the Baptist world. Well, in the Catholic world, you know, women still are not recognized in a role um, as leader. But my favorite trip was to the Vatican, where I sat with Pope Benedict. Had I gone as a minister, um, I wouldn't have gotten in. But going as a diplomat, an ambassador, not only did I sit with him, I was wow. in his prayer chambers, and I traveled with him from Rome to Assisi. And so those kind of moments when you're around people who are persuasive, who influence, who have an impact worldwide, you know, there are moments you pinch yourself. You know, and you say, my goodness, I am here. And so I want to make the best of the time that I have. I want to represent my president, my secretary of state, and my American people. It almost was the feeling like the Olympic Olympians when they're standing on that stage and they get the bronze, the silver, or the gold. You're like, I represent the United States of America. And with our challenges, and there are many, it still is one of the best countries in the world. And so you take that with you and you feel kind of like the NBC peacock, you're like, ooh, this is a moment. Um, <laughs> and so I've had many of those as well as dangerous moments. Well, we have to talk about the danger. And also, what is the memorabilia that you have in your home that when you walk past it, you're immediately reminded of all the various places that you've been? So you know what? I don't have a lot in my home. Um, first of all, there were countries that we were not able to take things out of. Uh, first of all, there's a limit on gifts, a dollar limit, but then there are certain countries that also will use gifts and they will use them to record you or to 
I use it as a spy tactic. And so most of the time we had to return those gifts or the State Department would have to do what they do to de, uh, detox them is the best word I would use. Um, so there's not a lot, you know, I have pictures from my first trip at 14 when my parents let me go to Spain and study abroad and come back to the Bronx where, you know, the Latinization of the Bronx was just happening. And so I, Puerto Ricanos were the main group that were coming into the Bronx and they were first generation. So remember their parents didn't speak a lot of English. The kids were going to school with us. So many times I was a translator for my friend's <laughs> parents, which is kind of mind blowing, a 14 year old black girl. But I say, you know, in Spain, I ate a lot of paella <laughs> and, you know, paella is a spicy gift. It's a dish is blended with many different flavors. And so I'm a paella. I was a pastor. I'm an amazing author, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a leading lady, and I'm an ambassador. So I'm a paella, and all of that is a blend of who I am. You're a beautiful <laughs> recipe. It, it is. Um, it, just because I'm fascinated, what I enjoyed reading about was when you do one of those Senate confirmations as you had to undergo as an ambassador, that ain't no joke. It's like being on trial yourself. And you had to do it a few times, right? I had to do it twice. It ain't no joke because remember, it was not just Republicans and Democrats, but there were tea parties at that time. Mm. And so there were three groups who had to really approve me. And when your vote goes, if your vote doesn't go through to the floor of the Senate, it disappears every other year as, as though you never existed. So a year and a half into it, my vote didn't hit the Senate floor. They don't have to say who they are if they hold your vote. They can just go on, go home for Christmas. It was this week, uh, that year in 2010, they go home and to their families and they just say, I don't have to answer. Um, you know, racism is behind it, uh, all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Some people just didn't want Obama's people to go through. And then I was able in the period in between, because when you're a candidate, you cannot talk to anyone. You can't say I'm a nominee. You can't say anything. Oh, but it's like period, being on American between, Idol. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, so I wasn't a candidate. Um, and so some amazing things happened because the person who held my vote was outed. Um, people in the State Department and White House who weren't as supportive as they should have been, they were outed. So when I went back the second time, um, it was unanimous because I was prepared behind the scenes. One of my friends says, you have to make sure the yeses line up before you go into any room. And you have to make sure not only the senators votes who are on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but all the yeses, again, in that climate of the U.S. Senate, Senate who are going to impact and affect your vote. So it's the staffers um, and all of those people who take you over and give you briefings. They have to be in the yes column also. If one is saying no and has the brakes on and you're thinking it's yes, and you have your foot pedal pedal to the metal, you know, you can't go forward and in reverse at the same time. So it was when the yeses lined up, when those conservatives said, we're going to help you. We're going to teach you politics 101 <laughs> because we believe, and this is very interesting. They said, we believe you are God's person for this position. And when they used God's language and faith language, I was like, okay, let's do it. And so I was prepped and I was prepared. I answered all the questions right the first time, but this again was about the climate that you're entering. And I had my yeses lined up. It's interesting how politics and ideology and religion all have to line up so that people feel like you are their idea. You know, it's like success has a million parents and failure is an orphan, mm -hmm. you know. So once you were their idea, it, you were gold. But you had to be Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer combined, whipping votes and and knowing when you went forward that you had it. Exactly. What a great analogy. I had to be both of those. I had to have my heels like Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> but I had to have Steny Hoyer's. <laughs> and when that all lined up, um, it was great. I think if you had to go through that process now, it would have been even more difficult. Oh, yeah. Because uh, I'll tell you, uh, er everything is political, even something that should be as positive and advanced as an ambassador for international religious uh, freedom. And 
I think in the world today, that job as ambassador may be a little more difficult because it seems like there's a real anti-Christian fervor in Muslim countries and Arab countries and China specifically, where people of Christian faith are really being persecuted badly now. I, I agree with that. Um, but you have to understand the assignment also. The assignment isn't to proselytize or say I'm a Christian and you got to be a Christian. The, the question is, are you honoring the United Nations Human Rights Declaration, which all countries sign on to? And so you may be a Christian nation and are you abusing people who are not Christian? And so you really have to understand the assignment and you can't personalize it, you can't proselytize it. And so that's why having a team and a staff are so important. You're prepped before you put your feet on their soil. You're prepped before you put your feet under the table, the diplomatic table. And you know what your mission is, and you know what you're supposed to bring back to the secretary and the president. Mm -hmm. Well, what do they teach you about the way to phrase things in a way that makes it feel like the other person's idea? Because I think it would be helpful for everybody in every walk of life to understand how to better phrase things to get positive outcomes, right? Well, I think the word is diplomatic, and each <laughs> situation is not touchy-feely. Some situations are you know, you were doing the same thing last year. So you're going to be put on the countries of particular concern list, which is not, sort of like the shame list. Mm -hmm. So it really is every situation is situational. And we have a foreign policy institute that prepares you for where you're going. So, you know, there's no one set of language. You learn the protocol, you know, whether you're supposed to shake the queen's hand or hug them or cannot hug them. If you're going into an orthodox culture, particularly with men, you have to do this. They're not going to shake the woman's hand. So it's every situation is situational. And so the language is really kind of coveted. And that's why you call the diplomat, because you're given coveted information mm -hmm. that is not supposed to be public. Mm -hmm. Wow. that You have to be someone that can really read a room uh, to even endeavor to go into this line of work, because it, I feel like you have that level of confidence where you walk in, you look around and you assess and then you know how to conduct yourself. Well, you know what? I don't think this height was by accident. You know, when you're growing up and you're 5'10", you know, you're like, oh, my gosh, all the little boys are 4'11". <laughs> you know, <laughs> will, will I ever, will they ever catch up? And then in junior high and high school, they start growing. But you still have this height. And I think there's something to be able to walk into a room and you really can uh, look around. Oh. And you can see um, who's where, what they're doing, their movements. And, you know, people don't look down on me. I look them eye to eye. And I think that that has been an advantage um, because I'm not a little thing where you can pat me on the head. I've seen men pat little women on the head and I just feel like, oh my God, she's not a little girl, but I look you eye to eye and we talk, we have a dialogue. And I really think that that's no accident. I think it's providential. In a way, but there are a lot of women who are tall who will try to shrink when they enter a situation. And I think you kind of always rose to your height and rose to every occasion just based on your natural personality that, that you've been blessed with and that you've um, cultivated. So I think that's, thank you. that's heroic. Thank you. you know, there's data now that says that the United States is becoming slowly more secular. First of all, do you agree with that? Second of all, how do we fix that? And third of all, what do you think the reason for that is? Oh, well, you know, I've been reading, I think the head of USA Today and the Times said there are these nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, that people don't have any faith at all. And so I agree with that. I think, you know, when you accept the diversity of our nation, that uh, you have really some of every culture, that they bring that culture with them. And some are agnostic and some are... Uh, atheists, and they had the right to do that, which is what I fought for all over the world, uh, that you had the right to not believe. Um, so I think that with diversity, you have to accept that all of that comes, you know, we're not just one nation under God, and we're not indivisible, as our Pledge of Allegiance says. So I think that's it. With President Clinton, his last two years, I was on the President's Initiative on Race. I was one of seven advisors. I was his faith advisor. And we went all over the world. And what he was trying to say is, look, it's not just black and white anymore. It's not just, you know, north and south. And that we are becoming a nation where 
white men are not going to be as numerous as they were. Um, and we have to understand that the borders have been open. So let's look at Lat Latinx. Let's look at Caribbeans. Let's look at Haitians. Let's look at Cubanos. And I think, you know, people didn't get it then. You know, in fact, we were booed in certain places. But I realized that with diversity comes all of that. People who don't believe, you know, I got up every Sunday and went to church. People on my floor, those 11 apartments knew I was going to church, but most of them were not going with me. Um, you know, they were sleeping in on Sunday. They were, some of them were uh, Seventh-day Adventists and they were going on Saturday. But I think there's a healthy respect for you do you mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. do what makes you tick. And so as a faith leader, I was always uh, many times swimming upstream because people, when they left our church, had to deal with a very secular world. And how do you keep your faith in the midst of secularism? Mm -hmm. What's amazing trend that's happening now is what they call faith ERGs, faith employee resource groups, where people who have faith in the midst of corporate America, where they never could talk about faith before, are saying, give us time. We if the Muslim needs to pray five times a day, Muslim men and women, and then I need to have a place to pray. And so American Airlines and about 200 corporations now, Intel, Texas Instruments, Google, are saying, yeah, if we're going to be a diverse country, then a diverse corporation, then we have to allow for that. So you see the good mm -hmm. and you see the struggle and the juggle, and that's happening. Ground zero, you know, I was on the front lines of ground zero. New York City, you could never go into a city building and mention prayer. You couldn't stop in the middle of the day and pray, which is why we created that lunch hour service. Ground zero happened. All the rules were thrown out. They were like, can you come in and pray with us? Can you make a difference? Can you have a worship service and police headquarters? And so I think, you know, situations change cultures. And um, that's why I see, think we're seeing the N-O-N-E-S, the nuns, because if you have a family that did not raise you in the faith, then what do you, you may find it on your own or you just may not. You know, you, you brought up a great point. I'll just add a second part of my question is uh, th that's what made me wonder. You know, it seems like in dark times and you pointed out 9-11 and that makes perfect sense. In darker times, we should lean on our faith more, whatever that faith is. And we, we feel the threat of the pandemic now. We feel the threat of the economy. We feel the threat of the separation of classes and races. This ought to be a time when you would think people would want to cling to their faith but I guess the data proves otherwise. And I don't know if I 100% believe the data, but it, it just seems like it should be a time when people lean on their faith more than they do. Well, the pandemic changed the game for faith leaders, certainly. One, if you didn't understand or learn how to do Zoom or other technology, you don't have a church anymore because mm -hmm. this was a game changer. And those who did could broaden their church. So my home church in Maryland, First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, is on six continents now. They went from 10,000, they were already a large church, but they now have an online campus. So people are doing the, uh, you know, everything that we do in church, the uh, ordinances, they're doing them from their bathtub if it's baptism, or they get a, a cracker and some juice for communion. And so it's changed the game. So I don't know if we're growing or if we're stagnant, but I know that if you didn't know technology, and you still don't, you're in that left behind series. And you better just, you know, just say we're closing the doors because we don't really know when we're going to be able to go fully in person again. Mm -hmm. Even if it's hybrid, you better know how to do that. Yeah. And do it well with excellence or you're going to lose everything. And also, so, you know, it's an it's an opportunity to learn, too, and, and to yes. for everybody to ramp up. And we all have ramped up our tech game so that, you know, if you had moved away from the church where, in which you grew up and you hadn't been bold enough to walk into a neighborhood church and find your new church family, you could visit your church family online in ways that you couldn't before the pandemic. So in a lot of ways, I think it's been helpful for people in that regard, getting everyone technologically ramped yeah, up. Yeah, particularly for shut-ins. I think it's yeah. really given older folks and people who don't have access to transportation or physically can't get out of the house. That's been one gift of that whole 
Zoom culture. Because it's not just services. It's like what I've watched you do is, you know, you have you have fellowship groups, you have meetings, you have conferences, you have book clubs, you have Bible study, you have all kinds of things that, are, you know, you could probably go to the church website and look online and see that they're scheduling almost, almost around the clock. Am I correct? Oh, you're absolutely correct. And online courses, you know, so if your Bible study is boring, you can just hit a little button <laughs> and you can go, you have a choice now but you're still getting the faith. And so I think there's going to be certainly an increase and that's exciting as well. You were talking about um, movies and, and books at the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. And I hope that there's one, it's a 10 minute film called um, The Unsung Sheroes of 9-11. And what we were able to do is visit 9-11 um, to visit where the 911 operators and dispatchers are on the 20th anniversary, what happened this year. And there are five women who were at ground zero trying to help people as they were perishing, getting police to down to ground zero, who are still 911 operators and dispatchers. And we honored them on this 20th anniversary. And they said, you know what? No one ever said hello. No one said thank you. Nobody acknowledged us. So it was sort of like the hidden figures of, of ground zero. And I hope that you'll get the link to that and be able to see it because it was tear jerking. And it's just to show you the resilience, again, that word we used earlier, of some people who just hung in there for, as New Yorkers, as operators who said, we love our job and we're going to be here all the way through. You send us a link and we'll put that in our show notes so that everybody can can enjoy, I love that. Can enjoy the film. You. Let's talk about your book because, I, you know, you're someone who in your spare time just kind mm -hmm. of will, you know, of a weekend whip out a book. It seems like you're up to 17 books. How many books have you written? It's 18 now, and so the last two are 17 and 18. Oh, my goodness. Now you're, she's birthing twins. So, <laughs> so yeah, tell, us about, tell us about your, your latest two books and, uh, and what inspired them. Well, thank you. Rhythms of Rest, 40 Devotions for Women on the Move, came out in August. It was inspired because I do an annual retreat for busy women. It's a faith-based wellness retreat. We take about 40 women away, you know, 40 is a biblical number, and we take them to Florida. It's called Selah by the Sea. It's Selah, S-E-L-A-H, is a word used in the Holy Bible 71 times in the Judeo-Christian Bible. And it means to pause. It means to reflect. It means to rest. And so we take community servant leaders, women who run churches, run community groups, run nonprofits, and we take them away. And so as a result of the last one, right before COVID, we had a publisher who was a part of that circle, and she said, let's write about this experience, just, you know, about watching the waves, about disconnecting from your technology. And that's the book of devotions that just came out that we hope people will read. It's on Amazon.com and OurDailyBread.org. Mm -hmm. The last one is called My Fabulous Fifth Chapter, It's My Turn Now. And again, it's a faith-based book, but it's for women who have 50 plus, uh, who have hit that big 5-0 or 6-0 or 7-0 or any number after a five. And it's about <laughs> how to be kind, fit, and absolutely fabulous. And so my tagline is, may the rest of your life be the best and most blessed of your life. Aww. It <laughs> too is available on Amazon and JudsonPress.com. So, you know, it's about giving yourself permission you know, we know the rules, but when are you going to have your turn? You've taken care of kids, you've care given for your parents and maybe others in the community. When do you get your turn? Fifth chapter, anytime after 50. Let, let me, I, I got to talk about this before we run out of time, because this is a topic important to me, and that's music. The Baptist Church, in particular, the Southern Baptist Church, in particular, the Baptist Church of the late 19th and 20th, early 20th century was responsible and the birthing place for two of my favorite kinds of music, jazz and blues. Mm. And it came out of the call and response that was established in the Southern Baptist Church. And my feeling, I was born and raised what was called High Episcopalian, which is slightly more boring than a High Catholic Mass. <laughs> and I always thought that we could have taken, we should watch Baptist services, particularly Southern Baptists, which are joyful and celebratory and full of music and full of energy and, and make our services more accessible to the human heart. Mm. But do you have any comment about, about how important 
the Baptist Church has been for the development of the two original American art forms, jazz and blues, and how it was all born, and previous to that, of course, born out of slavery and the field calls and all those things. But uh, the, the connection to the church has always been important to me. Yeah, you know, important to me, too. And I love all forms of music, and it did come out of the call and response. And, you know, many musicians were able to play in the clubs and then they came on Sunday and they had to just change the beat, syncopate it a little bit. But many times that was their second gig. You know, we're a gig economy again, but it's the most beautiful music. I love all forms, jazz, blues. And, you know, my favorite era was Motown. Mm -hmm. So I just saw the Tina Turner play on Broadway. um, And I just highly recommend it. You know, while, you know, Proud Mary keeps on burning. <laughs> like if those legs can do that at 80, then the fifth chapter women need to read this book. Dreams don't have an expiration date. No, that, that woman has book. overcome more than most people will ever have to in their life. Very much so. I mean, abuse and, you know, and still she made it. So Maya Angelou has this poem, And Still I Rise. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Tina Turner is one of those who, mm-hmm. no matter what, she was knocked down, she still rises. And I think that that's a common theme in our church is that no matter what you've gone through during the week, you're still rising. And mm-hmm. I'm a witness of it. And I sit in the pews with people who are still rising. So my thought is, you keep rising. And Maya Angelou ends with this poem. She says, phenomenal woman, that's me. And that's what I want you to know. Phenomenal woman, that's me. You are a phenomenal woman. Uh, and and you have turned your book into a, a show. So you have a YouTube and a Facebook channel. And talk about the types of groups that you that you like to put together. I listened to the one where you had the mothers of all of the kids who grew up with your son together, just kind of reflecting back on you know what you had collectively done, which raised wonderful wonderful men. Yes. Well, we're gonna we call them Fabulous Fridays mm-hmm. again for my. So you can call me Dr. Fabulous. And we had people from my childhood all the way up to, like you said, adulthood, where we've done things together in our fifth chapter. They're doing amazing things. One went to nursing school, and now she's out in the fields of Idaho helping people who get caught in the in the wild. Um, but we raised our sons together. And so this last group, and we're going to run the Fabulous Fridays. You can go to YouTube.com. It's Live with Sue J, Fabulous Fifth. And we're going to run them again because this last show were three mothers, uh, two are white and uh, one Latino and myself. We had five sons together. We had collectively five sons who were friends since nursery school. One Latino, one Irish American, one Jewish Italian, my son African American and one Dominican. And they have stayed friends. They all finished high school, came back together, finished college, came back together, now young adults. But it was showing us the power of friendship that crosses the racial ethnic lines. And so as a result, uh, three of them went to boarding school. And so we started having Mother's Day uh, because we missed our son. (laughs) And we made it a Mother's Day tradition that we'd get together, not to you know, cry over missing them, but that we would become friends too. And so we have celebrated. So they did our last show, Maria Tassani and Joanne Bainey. And what a wonderful friendship. But the first show were my childhood friends from Sunday school at the Presbyterian Church, Mm -hmm. um, one of my college classmates, and all the people that we've remained friends across the years and across the lines. So that age is more just, just a number and ethnicity is a line that we don't draw but we cross it. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. So Fabulous Fridays, youtube.com slash Ambassador Sujay. And I spell Sujay, S-U-J-A-Y. And I, I just love it. I, jo- I love the way you're bringing these conversations uh, to life. And all your friends are beautiful and lovely and, and, and have so much to share, so much wisdom. And I, I really appreciate what you're doing. It's, it's so inspiring. And especially in these times where we're not really being stimulated enough with conversation and that you bring these conversations uh, to us is just a gift. So thank you for that. So we're going to close our show right now. And before we do that, we're going to just beg for reviews. Take it away, Fritz. 
Okay, if you enjoyed this episode of Media Path, it would help us to be more discoverable by potential new listeners. If you leave us a quick review on Apple Podcasts, and if you're new here and this is your first time with us, please check out our back catalog. You're going to find episodes binge-worthy. For instance, comedy, art, and healing with two very skilled comedians, Eric Schwartz and Cynthia Levin. We had Laverne, Shirley, and Perseverance with Cindy Williams from Laverne and Shirley. She couldn't have been more charming talking about her new stage play about her life in show business and TV production and the art of the interview with Barry Kibrick is fascinating as well. Thank you for spending an hour with us and we would be overjoyed if you took a moment to share your thoughts with us or recommend us to a friend. And we would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter where we are at Media Path Pod and on Facebook where we are Media Path Podcast. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you have been enjoying so you can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderful guests, Susan Johnson, Cook, Ambassador Sujay. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco Demanda. John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path. That was, that was wonderful. wonderful. Your, your congregation is so lucky to get to listen to you yeah. on Sunday.